the organ is very much the instrument of the composers because what you're doing in interpreting an organ piece is almost like composing. You're making decisions based on your musical idea projected into the future. You're not making them in the moment that you're playing. You're thinking that, okay, in the concert, I think uh, the hall will have this atmosphere. The psychology will be like this. Therefore, I want this kind of sound. And I want it to be, let's say, a really dark sound. And then I will take away all the uh, two and four foot. Um, but if I have to do that beforehand. At beforehand, at the moment where I'm deciding. I once uh, played a concert with orchestra, actually, and, and organ. And uh, when I came to the rehearsal, I was starting to discover, and then I saw a handwritten piece of paper written by the custodian of the organ. And it says, you must use almost all the registers all the time if you want the organ to have any chance uh, to compete dynamically with the orchestra. I thought, well, okay, uh, he, he probably knows the instrument well, so I do it, everything out. We did the rehearsal. And then after the rehearsal, uh, I was sort of walking through the orchestra and everybody was like afraid of me. <laughs> Whenever I would walk, everybody would be like this. <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually somebody said, Mister, uh, does it have to be that loud? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, with what I'm saying is with the organ, it's actually quite easy to uh, have misunderstandings because what you hear uh, at this position is not necessarily what you hear over there. And therefore, it's, it's really important to come for rehearsals and to point your ears in all the different directions.
Well, the, the question about how one feels music as opposed to hear it, um, it's very important for the organ. And when I'm making registrations and also when I'm playing, the, the tiny decisions that I play and that I take when I play, for example, about timing, uh, also about um, which registers to use and which, um, on which manual to play. All of these things are to do with a kind of perception which is not only oral, but also visceral. Um, for example, at this place, I actually don't hear the uh, 32 foot. Okay. Um, if, if there's um, maybe 10 registers together, I, I don't really hear it.
I would say that I am a curious person and that I love music very much for all the different things that it can do. I do, of course, have areas and ideas where I might be quite narrow-minded. I think everybody has these uh, areas. And I guess for me, ever since I started to know music, ever since I started to have something to do with it, ever since I started to love it, there have been certain things which have always been particularly attractive to me. Some of these things uh, are technical, for example, counterpoint, uh, voice leading, um, structure in, in general. And if you think of the, the arias of Mozart operas and how he s builds certain ones from very small cells, and I think this is an incredibly beautiful thing which speaks for the power of music, not only as a vehicle to transmit some story, but also as an art in and of itself. Um, I refer also to the writings of Camille Saint-Saëns about this, that truth is not uh, something universal to be uh, defined as truth or non-truth, but that there is something as an artistic truth. And it's uh, what he calls the, the sens du style, the sense of the style, or the, the aesthetic sense, which is so important in music, um, which is actually separate from anything that could do with meaning. So often one asks uh, about a piece of music, well, what does it represent? What does it mean? Uh, what does it make you feel? Or what is it about? But uh, Saint-Saëns is quite right in saying that uh, if you need this information to be able to uh, understand music, then you actually don't like music. <laughs> then you actually just like the thing around it. I think uh, it, is, it, it would be wrong to say that uh, to try to deny that music uh, takes a lot of its power from the fact that it's music. Uh, it's not just all about personal expression. There's something really universal and uh, one could say uh, not at a human level about the structures that make music music. So I think this is one answer to your question, why I'm so interested in uh, the works of many different eras. It's because these are the things which do not change over time. I love traveling in time and space, uh, and music lets me travel in time.
associate Baroque music with Bach, but I think people uh, in Bach's day definitely did not. <laughs> Bach was not, he was not a fashionable composer, and one can actually understand why and how uh, people would have appreciated in uh, relation with the uh, intellectual currents of the time, a music which was much more open and more empirically based than, than Bach's music, which was very much esoteric and, uh, and artificial, in the sense that uh, Bach will follow a rule, uh, or he will follow an, an idea, an idea that purely exists in his head, whereas the whole scientific uh, revolution of the time was to say that let's not try to make theories that uh, are somehow based on other theories or theories which just seem to make some sense uh, for what they are. Let's try to uh, start with an open mind and let's see what we can actually observe. The, the whole idea of, uh, of um, the empirical scientific practice and the enlightenment. Let's see what we can observe and let's find out the most simple theory which will fit this. I think some of this has rubbed off into music as well. And uh, Handel and Mozart were, of course, people who, uh, who were able to realize the gains of this kind of thinking and put them into something which was uh, nevertheless sufficiently profound so as to transcend the boundaries of that which was observable at that time. So uh, to be more precise, of course, uh, Mozart's suite is a direct homage to Handel. And uh, it was at this time that he also looked at a lot of, um, of orchestral scores, uh, even revising some of them. You've probably done the Messias uh, here. In, uh -huh. And this was uh, a, an encounter which completely changed the course of Mozart's musical development and probably also paved the way for later composers to start to think of their compositions not as being a part of an immediate uh, social and musical and artistic context, but as being part of an everlasting tradition. The fact that Mozart would uh, make a music which is neither in his era nor in another, something like the Fantasy and Fugue, uh, it, it really is a kind of um, a, a view from above where you have already an overview of the 17th century and the 18th century um, sort of together and uh, you realize that all of all of the music from those eras they were the product of one thing they were the product of the human mind and the world in which we live in the, the world in general not the world of 1780 or the world of 1740 and to have realized this, I think, was a great revolution in, in music. We see it today. Classical music uh, is music from five different centuries. This was never the case uh, in, in the past. And that's why, for me as a composer, it's very meaningful to make these bridges across time because it is, it is actually these bridges which are the, the primary substrate upon which we are building today.
I would say that uh, my main education was in the natural sciences. Um, I consider uh, myself to be somebody who is curious uh, in matters relating to reality, because reality is the most beautiful thing that exists, in my opinion. And I'm also, of course, curious about the abstract, which is why in the end, uh, actually, I completed my education in pure mathematics, which is much more similar to music, in the sense that, it's, uh, that it does not have to be true. Or it, it does not have to be uh, corresponding to that which we see in our everyday lives as corporal human beings. Mm, I think for us uh, mathematicians, it's really very much about a search for, um, for beauty and interest. Um, in a way related to this intrinsic quality you were mentioning about music. Like, is, is there a relationship there? Or yes, I, I think if I do see a relationship between music and mathematics, it's here that we are motivated by things which uh, have a, an intrinsic truth to them, an intrinsic, not an external one, not, not one that's imposed by observations, and which are somehow complex enough and simple enough at the same time to tickle something in our brain, which makes us uh, sort of uh, able to enter a state of uh, of intellectual ecstasy. So in the beginning of the, of the confinement, I did uh, a project while I was at the church where I recorded mm, sort of lectures about music because I always thought classical music is something where the more you know, the more you appreciate. I think in general this is true. This, this is actually saying a lot because, uh, for example, Magic is not that. <laughs> and I, I think, um, <laughs> yes, ma magic is, is probably the opposite. And I can also imagine that uh, there are many things in even an art like painting, where if one is no longer in awe of the technique and, uh, and just by the fact that uh, someone like uh, Diego Velázquez can and make a random bunch of lines look like something incredibly luminous and evocative, you know, like the, the belt of the, of, of the, of the, of the princess. Um, if one is no longer in awe of that, painting probably loses some of its visceral draw. The wonderful thing about music is that, oh, well, uh, let me just talk about classical music so I don't extend too far is that this is not the case. There's maybe just, I'm, I'm not trying to be derogatory to anyone, but there's probably f at least half of the audience for whom the primary interest is in the mastering of mechanical difficulties. When they look at an orchestra playing together or when they look at um, whatever instrument, basically not failing at, uh, at playing. Um, and when you go past this, when you realize that actually these things are just the result of um, what is probably for the normal um, non-professional musician a few years of, uh, of training and for the, the professional musician probably five minutes of looking at a score, uh, when you get past this, it doesn't become less interesting. It actually becomes more interesting. And that's why I always thought it was the most important thing really for us in this situation where we have already climbed past this first barrier uh, to show people how beautiful it is on the other side and to try to incite people to come into this way of looking at an art which is uh, which has uh, in, in a sense exceeded the the mechanical craftsmanship by such a high extent mm -hmm.